Susan, welcome to the show. So glad to have you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm really excited to talk with you about uh, this idea of personal branding. As I was kind of talking to you a little bit before we started, I've had a few uh, personal branding experts reach out on the podcast and um, hasn't really been something I pulled the trigger on. But what really intrigued me about uh, you and your story was this kind of idea of um, helping people with zigzag career paths. And I'm a person that, uh, as, as my audience really knows, I've had about six different careers, I feel like, and I, I probably won't ever stop. Uh, <laughs> that number will probably keep growing uh, as, I, as I grow. So I think this idea of, um, you know, personal brand and understanding the career, you know, your, your career path and your story around that for somebody like me is something I've just really struggled with. And so I'm super happy to, to talk to you um, about that and really dig into that topic. Uh, but as I kind of start all of my interviews, I want to kind of just start with, you know, uh, your career path uh, and, and how maybe you've got to where you are now, maybe starting around college or if you have a particular, uh, <laughs> particular uh, story even earlier than that, feel free to start earlier. Sure, I can uh, tell you the story of my life in a nutshell, um, and and you'll quickly see that there's a reason that I've gravitated toward working with people and writing about the zigzag path because that is very much my own, and um, I really relate to what you were just saying, um, and I think that it's something that you know a lot of us who have so many. I mean, most people have so many different interests and facets to who they are. And so it's not surprising that there are things that pull us in different directions, some of which earn more money than others, but are, you know, perhaps equally important in our sense of identity and, um, you know, how we want to craft our careers. So I was an art major in college, art and art history. Um, and that has always been my kind of passion, hobby, whatever you want to call it. Um, and, but I, I was offered a job in consulting, um, you know, these firms kind of come to campus and they do a big recruiting show. And I remember the reason I was drawn to it as I went to one of these information sessions and they said, you know, are you a person who enjoys solving puzzles? I mean, not actual table puzzles, but like kind of unraveling the bits and pieces of a problem and figuring it out. And guess what, that's called strategy. And so if you are interested in that, like come and chat with us. And so I did, it was the Boston Consulting Group um, was the company I ended up working for. And those big management consulting firms, they do this type of interview um, where it's a case study interview. So they give you kind of this setup, like, okay, this company has this problem and you, know, you can ask us questions to help us figure out the solution. And they use that as a way of figuring out how you think. And I just found all of those interviews, those problem setups and like the way of kind of you know, ferreting out the information and putting pieces together in a new way, super, super interesting. So that was where my interest in strategy came, even though I had never taken an economics class, I had no business experience whatsoever. And, um, you know, I'm very grateful that uh, a firm like BCG took a chance on somebody like me. Um, I learned so much working there. Um, but I was always on the side kind of writing, making art, you know, pursuing that stuff, which is not that easy when you have a kind of very demanding job. And then also what happens, I think, is um, that you get your, your sort of sense of identity is a little bit uh, wrapped up in your job description, especially when you're young. And so I suddenly became like, oh, you're a business person, you know, you're a consultant, you're this type of person, which in fact, I wasn't really that type of person at all. <laughs> I didn't fit the Myers-Briggs type uh, that typically works in that um, role. And I, and the other thing that I really missed there it's an amazing organization, but it's not like a particularly visual job, right? And so that, I knew that there was something missing for me. So I went and I, um, I said, well, I'm gonna take a job in like nonprofit arts management, maybe like with a museum or ended up taking a job with a theater, um, which was amazing. Oh, another little zigzag I forgot to mention is that I, I raised my hand for an assignment in Asia while I was working for BCG. So, and that was completely out of my comfort zone and definitely kicked off a lifelong love of travel. I got to do a lot of travel around Southeast Asia. I lived in Singapore for a couple of years and I landed that second job in Singapore, um, which was not at all my plan, completely unexpected, turned out to be an amazing experience. So I ran a nonprofit repertory theater there for two years. 
Um, and then really hesitated about going to business school um, because, you know, you do, again, you kind of, you become forever an MBA once you have an MBA, right? And all the good things that that carries and maybe some of the not as good things that that carries. Um, so I thought long and hard about maybe I wanted to get a master's or a PhD in art history or go a different direction. But in the end, I got an MBA. Um, and again, I mean, couldn't be more grateful for the experience that I had and particularly the people that I met. Um, I went to Harvard, which is, you know, an amazing institution and people from all over the world and all walks of life. And, and so I spent two years there. Um, I went back to BCG for a couple of years. Um, they're, you know, generous enough to help you with your tuition. So that's a, a very nice thing. But also, I, you know, I really did enjoy consulting. Um, and I was lucky enough to land there during a time when we were doing a lot of consumer goods work, particularly around, it was a time when the internet was taking off. People were, as it turned out, it was really a branding challenge, right? Like how does our brand live in this new universe called the internet when we've always defined ourselves in terms of bricks and mortar? And so that's where I started to learn about this discipline of branding. And as I then researched kind of what that was all about, I started freelance. So I, I left BCG after two years after business school. And I thought I'm gonna take some time and you know just make art. It's been a you know very uh, busy you know that's a busy lifestyle. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do next, so I got a studio in Brooklyn and I just made art all day long and I paid the bills by doing some freelancing, and um, and I and also started selling my artwork. And so there was a little bit of a fork in the road there. Like, do I double down on this art career and? you know, try to get representation and really make that my primary career? Or do I pursue this, you know, this kind of brand strategy world that I'm just starting to get to know? And honestly, the reason that I that I chose the brand strategy was because I really wanted to keep the artwork, something that I do for myself. And probably because I'd gone to business school, I had this like supply and demand in the back of my head. So I started noticing like, people would buy those blue paintings. I guess I should make more blue paintings, which is a terrible way to be an artist, right? It's a good way to be a business person. So, sorry, this is probably a longer story than you were looking for, but this is the zigzag path, right? Like you're all, you know, and that's why I'm telling it in some detail. Anyway, I'll cut to the end of the story, which is I spent, um, you know, about 10 years working in branding agencies um, and then started my own. Um, partly driven by, I was a mom of young children. And so I was looking to find a lifestyle that, you know, the kind of freedom and flexibility that I wanted as a parent of young kids. Um, and also the ability to sort of do the type of work that really suited me and where I could, you know, have some input on the design side and I could be the one writing the messaging because those are the things that I really enjoyed. And it turned out actually to my surprise that I really enjoy being an entrepreneur. So that was also a nice kind of uh, learning and certainly has made that journey of running a business easier. The fact that I actually really enjoy, you know, running a business. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I actually love the long story. Um, when people ask me, hey, oh, hey, what do you do? I, the fir my first question back to them is how much time do you have? Because <laughs> Uh, I feel like I can put the thread together and, and tell it in a way that makes sense to me um, of the, the windy path of how I got to be where I'm at. But it's always a question mark of does that land? I mean, you know, that's a, that's yep. a and so that's problem, exactly right. 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 Yeah. So that's exactly what people come to me for now. So I spent a couple of years, I mean, spent 10 years um, doing corporate branding. I still do some corporate branding, but kind of happened organically in the last three or four years where I started working with individuals either who were starting companies of their own or were just at a crossroads in their career going, oh, wait, you do this. You can take that messy story and turn it into something, you know, tight. And so it started from that perspective, finding, as you said, finding the through line of like this whole glorious mess of all the things that you've done. And there is a through line, but it can be. And I think the reason I like to tell my long version of the story is because see how hard that is to tell and when you you know you don't always have this opportunity that you're giving me to tell that whole story right you meet somebody and you need to kind of find that 10 second version that gives them a little bit of color makes it interesting and memorable but also is kind of clear and compelling and relevant to whatever it is that you're talking about with that person 
So finding the through line of your story um, is kind of the angle that I come at it from in terms of how are you then? Because of course, what people want, people don't really care. It's not like people come to me and they say, I'm super excited about building my personal brand, right? Yeah. Like you kind of like, yeah, I guess I need a personal brand. And it's almost like, oh, that's a pain in the butt. But what you really do want is a career that makes you happy, right? Or like some clarity about what you're going to do next and kind of the confidence to move forward with that. And so dialing back for, from, okay, if that's your goal, how are you going to get there? Well, telling your story is one really huge step that you can take in terms of moving toward that goal. And the process that I find, the process of helping, of writing that story and distilling it down, distilling it down actually helps people with that other piece of the question of like, what do I really want to do next? Right. Makes sense. Um, I, before I get too far down the hole of, of personal branding. I do have one follow up from something er, you said very early, and I just I can't um, I can't <laughs> I can't let it go. So you you kind of told the story about how you um, uh, BCG was sort of re recruiting, and, and you really enjoyed that that interview process. I've always been fascinated with management consulting and you know investment banking, like how they hire, because I would always see like English majors in the bond department, you know, at some at some uh, uh, you know big financial company. Um, what, what would you be doing or what do you think you would be doing if you had never come across BCG? Because you were an art major. What did you plan on doing before that kind of fateful moment? Yeah. So I thought I was going to go into some sort of arts management role. So my internships in college where I had an internship with the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts um, and, you know, curatorial and fundraising and trying to figure out where that might fit. I had an internship with Sotheby's looking at the whole auction house world. Um, yeah, I mean, and then I, I also did some, while I lived in Singapore, I actually did some writing, um, some kind of art criticism and uh, interviewing artists. And so journalism was another potential path. Um, but I think if I had never stumbled upon the business management consulting MBA type of path, I would have ended up, you know, in that world. Okay. I, I ask because, you know, it's, it's just so interesting to me. I'm always fascinated with like, we're supposed to discover ourselves kind of in college and figure out what we want to do. And then we have all these experiences where we realize like, wow, the world's a lot bigger <laughs> than I thought it was. Um, and, and that seemed like it was kind of one of those moments for you. So I, I love kind of digging into that kind of stuff. Absolutely. And uh, as I have high school age children now who are, you know, especially in this world we live in where we're all supposed to have a brand and they're like, why don't I know yet what I want to do with my life? I'm like, whoa, you're 14. It's going to be okay. <laughs> You've got some time. Right. Okay. So, so we, we've talked a little bit about personal brand. I mean, what, what really in your, in your eyes, what is a personal brand? Why is it important? Cause we do hear it all the time. Um, but, but those two things, you know, what is it? Why is it important? So for me, the way I like to think about it, and I think the, the most important first way of thinking about it is your personal brand is really about that story that you tell about yourself, but what's important about that story, you're telling it to yourself as well, by the way, but what's really important about that story as a brand is that the brand is a relationship that you're building with whoever you're telling that story to. Right. I mean, that's true if your brand is Fruit Loops, like you're building a relationship with your consumer base. And so in a much more intimate way, that brand, that that story that you are telling that helps other people understand who you are and why they might want to work with you, be friends with you, you know, whatever, connect with you in some way. It's really about that relationship building. And then, yes, there's a you know more practical level, which, you know, the brand lives on whatever platform, you know, you're a speaker, you're a social media, you know, whatever your platforms are, you run a business. Um, that's kind of where the brand gets expressed. I think that a lot of people start there, right? And they think that the brand is like, well, my brand is my Instagram account or right, or my brand is my website. And um, I think think that the best way to build a brand is to start a little further upstream from that and think about, you know, who you really are inside, 
where you really want to be going, what your values are, and then who do you want to connect given all of that? Who do you want to connect with? And then you can start to think about where and how you're going to connect. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. I think that I talked to a lot of, so you gave some examples of like creatives, entrepreneurs and things like that, uh, consultants and, and brand. And, and I, we, we talked to a lot of those types of people. And we also talked to a lot of people who are just trying to, just trying to find that next job. And I think what I kind of say is you're looking to stand out, right? Like, yes. uh, your hiring manager for whatever role is going to get hundred thousand, you know, job applications. How do you stand out? And yep. your brand platform is whatever the medium is there, right? It could be, it could be as you know, uh, drudgy as a, as a resume, but it could be a cover letter. It could be how you reach yep. out to that person. And it's definitely LinkedIn. Um, yep. So it's, it's all of those types of things, but what you said about connecting with making that connection and standing out, like that's kind of what it is to me. Um, what are, so what are some keys to a personal brand? So I think this is an answer to that question, but it also, I was thinking about when you were saying that, that, you know, you have all these different touch points, right? Your LinkedIn or your resume or whatever. And it's about, connecting with those people that you want to connect with. And that is true, as you said, whether you're looking for a job or you're starting a business or, you know, you're doing some consulting. Um, but what I, what I like to think of it as, or the important piece of that is you are connecting with individuals. And I think we, it's easy to get lost in, especially in the world where it's easy to connect one to many on social media platforms. I think a lot of people then find that overwhelming because they think, oh, I have to have something that's for everyone. Actually, those followings and those communities are built one relationship at a time. And if you just focus on that one relationship at a time, you will find your tribe. Um, and so I think that's one of the keys. Um, another thing I would I always say is, you know, it needs to really be authentic. So before you start thinking about what other people want you to be or what they want to hear, which, you know, we'll get there in a minute because it is important to speak in a language that connects with people. But before you do that, it needs to be really authentically you. Now, what that does not mean is it does not need to be comprehensive. Right. So you're not going to tell that whole story that I just told here. Right? You're going to tell like a tiny version of that. And maybe a slightly longer version in a different context, but you need the tiny version of that, but it has to be really truthful and sort of encapsulate the spirit of who you are, which is not easy, right? That's, that's like a big ask, but it needs to be very genuine. And so it needs to come from kind of who you really are and what you really value. And then you make the connection. This is the order in which I do work with people. So I have them start thinking about those things. And then as a second step, a few weeks later, then we're thinking about, okay, so who is in your tribe? Like, do you know, um, or, you know, can you imagine what is, what is that next step that you're going for? And, you know, is it potential employers? Is it CEOs? Cause you want a board seat. Is it, you know, C-suite executives because you want to do consulting, whoever that is. Um, you know, let's think about what their world is about and what are what are their needs, what's top of mind for them, and where does that connect with who you are and what you can offer? Okay, um, that's super helpful for me. I, I think obviously like branding, um, when you do one thing, right, and you've done one thing, built, built one career, it, it at least seems like it's a little bit easier, but as we kind of talked about this zigzag career path, um, winding road that at least at least you and I have definitely been on I'm pretty sure a lot of our audience has as well um you know like I always kind of I would go back and forth but I feel like I, I would a lot of times view the zigzag career path as a negative because it was so hard it just seems so hard to put the the story together and I know and, and, and I also think it kind of in some ways stunts growth there's some stop start uh you know to that but you really seem to Seem to view this as a very big positive. I mean, I think you've ever even seen, you know, on your on your website. I think it even says, uh, you know, this, some of the smartest, most talented people are often all over the place in quotes in their careers. You know, wh how do you, why do you view that uh, as a as a 
big positive? I mean, that's just been, first of all, my anecdotal, you know, not database, but my anecdotal experience is that I meet all these amazing, talented people who, by the way, also are like super educated and accomplished. And then you kind of secretly find out in a sidebar conversation, they're like, actually, I also do stand up comedy. You're like, what? <laughs> you know, and but I think what's great. So there are a few things that I that I feel very strongly are great about the zigzag zigzag path, notwithstanding everything that you said is true. It is a little harder. Um, and if you know, if I were a different person who didn't want to do all of those things, I often think, oh, maybe that would be easier. But there are these huge benefits, one of which is when you're going, when you're moving about in different spheres, which are not necessarily related to each other or even overlapping, you're just meeting different people, right? So you just have a broader network and you're getting exposed to different ideas. And I think that then is very important for whenever you bring that stuff back from another bubble that you're a part of into the bubble you're working in at the moment, you're just thinking about things differently and you're bringing in new resources and it's you're just more innovative as a result. Um, and I think the other thing is that, you know, from a storytelling perspective, you mentioned being memorable and standing out, which is of course the ultimate, you know, is this a good story or not? Um, and it's it's actually much easier to be memorable when you have um, that little spark that's an unexpected thing. So one of my clients is a you know a real estate agent building up a um, building up book of business and now really trying to build a firm. And several sessions in, it turns out that she was a very accomplished Broadway actress. Um, amazing singer, lots of credentials under her belt in that sphere, but she never talked about it before in her real estate business. But wouldn't you remember, you know, if you're talking to five or six different real estate agents and they're all telling you they're going to help you with this or that. And then one of them is like, oh, that's so cool. She was on Broadway. Mm -hmm. And, you know, does that necessarily link? And I, another uh, friend, colleague of mine who uh, is a lawyer, who also is a Bollywood actress. So <laughs> you're going to remember that, right? And, and, you know, even if it doesn't have specific tie-ins, which by the way, it always does, but always. even if it didn't have specific tie-ins to your skill set in that realm, it certainly makes you stand out. And then as it turns out, for example, this um, person who's the actor and, and real estate person, um, yeah, of course, she approaches those client meetings with kind of a lightheartedness and joy and almost theatricality which makes her really fun to work with. You know, she, she said, well, I'm not tap dancing down the hallways. I said, I know, but your personality, like it makes so much sense. And that is a differentiator for you with your clients. So I love those stories when those little things pop up. Yeah, I get, I get what you say about innovation. And just, I think there's just like, it's something about the different perspectives that you have um, when you combine experiences from what, what, what other what otherwise look at like disparate paths. It's always been a, I think it's just a double-edged sword for me. Like I, I kind of have my alter ego, uh, which I, I have a cousin who's like about my age, who has always been in uh, kind of corporate consulting and the same company the whole time. And I look at, at him and where he's at in, a, you know, in his life. And it's, I'm like, man, he just keeps working the flywheel, right? Like <laughs> every little ounce of energy that he puts back in is now, you know, really generating for him because he's just been on this path and he's known. And, and, and I look at, you know, sometimes, sometimes I say, man, I don't, I, you know, could never live that life, which is great for me. And other times I'm like, Oh, man, it just seems so easy too. Um, so it's just always this kind of push pull double edged sword um, thing. But at the end of the day, I always come back to saying like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade it for anything. Cause I think it, I think it, it absolutely, when you are able to sort of change your career path and conquer that challenge, you're just so much more, you know, resilient. Um, and maybe at least for me, unafraid uh, to sort of pivot my career again, or make a change or, you know, do something like go without some income for a while, because that would normally be scary, but, but it's not anymore because I've been able to do that. So I think like, that's all, those are all things I'm, I've incorporated over the years into, I guess my, 
you know, brand story as like, I'm the changer. I'm the guy that breaks work um, and, and trying to get other people to, you know, kind of break out of their, their work. Um, so I totally resonate with that. Is that, is that how you kind of see it too? Like, is, yeah. Is it- and believe me, I have, and still sometimes have that thought process that you have when you see that person who actually seems really happy in what they're doing, but is one of those, like they found that thing early and they just kept at it and look how far they've gotten. You have that idea like, oh my gosh, did I waste a lot of time? (laughs) And it looks like much more efficient, but I think it comes back to what are the metrics that you measure success by? And, you know, if that person who did it that kind of efficient way is really happy, well, like, awesome for them and they got lucky, um, you know, but I, I have to think about my own metrics and I, that's, I encourage my clients to think about what are your own metrics and, and my personal belief system, not just for me, but I, I believe that the kind of highest metrics should be about happiness and joy. And, you know, are you living the life that, you know, kind of makes you feel comfortable in your own skin and that you're getting something out of. So, you know, for, for me personally, then it's much more about like the richness of everything that's around me and this exploration than it is about how far I've gotten on the journey. That's not true for everybody, but I think it's important to do that work, to think about like, what are, what do you care about? Like what, you know, what's going to make your life and work life feel successful and that you have a sense of integrity about what you've done. Right. And it it seems like, you know, right now, the thing in the news is the great resignation. Uh, People are, and and I think you, you call it basically the, uh, the great reassessment. Uh, I I don't, I don't know if those things are exactly the same thing. So I'll I'll let you talk (laughs) about what, what the great reassessment is, but I mean, we're, we're right in there and and it is, it seems like people are poking their heads up to look from a 30,000 foot view instead of the 5,000 foot view and, and trying to say like, okay, what makes the most sense for me and how do I want to live my life? Yeah. I think the great resignation is like, okay, if you look at the data, you can actually see that people are resigning from their jobs and or, and or leaving the workforce in record numbers. I think the great reassessment, which by the way, I did not make that up. I actually read it in the Wall Street Journal maybe. Um, And I thought, okay, this is very interesting to me because this is almost like the bigger picture from the resignation. And there's probably a whole bunch of people who are not even captured in that resignation data who are fundamentally reassessing what they do with their work. I mean, look at how all of us are just de facto reassessing where we work just as a small portion of that. Right? Are we in the office? Are we hybrid? Like, how are we managing meetings? Will we go back to conferences? Um, and that's just a sliver of what your work life is about. And I, so I just think it's a moment where people feel uh, some combination of safe to reassess because everyone else is doing it, um, or and or compelled to reassess because things have changed and shifted beneath them, and now you know okay, I have to really start thinking about this. Um, and, you know, once that, that reassessment and frankly, the zigzag becomes more normalized, it's just much easier to participate in it. And I think that the zigzag piece already was becoming much more normalized in the last, I don't know, 10 or 15 years. Ever since there was such a thing as an Etsy side hustle, suddenly the world had changed, you know? And if I think like, 20, 25 years ago, you would have to hide that from your employer. And I think nowadays, you know, if you're selling, I don't know, greeting cards on Etsy, your banking employer is probably like, that's pretty cool, (laughs) you know? (laughs) So I think it's a cultural shift that's been underway for a while. And I think the pandemic, like it did with so many things, accelerated and showed a spotlight on it. Yeah, COVID seemed to definitely accelerate underlying trends that were already there for sure. I mean, remote work, one of them, I run a remote, small remote company. We were remote well before the pandemic. Um, The idea that you can, as you said, side hustle, self-work, the internet, all of those types of things, definitely underlying trends. Yeah, and, and, and culturally, I mean, when I hire somebody for my team, again, we're small, but but we're all over the place. But I mean, one of the things I say is, what, do, you, do you have a side hustle going on? And that's because like, I, I actually want that. 
I want the person to be out there learning and, and, and doing something that they're sort of innately passionate about because whatever they learn is going to be attributable to our business too. And, and it, it just makes people more creative. Um, so it, it, so that, that was one, kind of one of the follow-ups I, I wanted to say, like, it, it seems like one of the, one of the pieces in this whole reassessment is, is creativity about our, our careers overall, but also just getting creativity in our, in the work that we may do if we, if we have a job, how can people become more creative at work or just thinking about their careers in general? Well, you just nailed a huge piece of it, which is this intersection of, you know, I call them spheres or bubbles, but, and by the way, I am going to quote you with my clients who often worry about, you know, their potential employers thinking they're too scattered and whatnot. No, their potential employers are like, do you have a side hustle? Because that's a bonus, right? Like it makes you a more interesting person and it's to your creativity question. That's how you become more creative at work. Do more stuff, travel more, whatever it is. It doesn't really matter. You can have, you know, your hobby is welding. Awesome. You're going to bring some stuff from whatever those things you do are into your work. It could be reading, but you know, the more, I think the more things people are into, the more interesting they are and the more creative they are when they tackle a problem. Um, and I, so I have a friend who used to work in the music business and then started a tech company in the real estate space, like totally different lines of work. And she, she said she would like take her team out to jazz clubs and stuff. And they're like, wow, you are so good at like creating community and, you know, the social piece. And we have like this really bonded team. And she's like, well, yeah, cause that's what you do in the music business. Like that's all you do. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I'm really good at that. So, I mean, again, just there's a million of these funny little examples that you might not even realize are so meaningful, but they are, you're bringing those skill and that that is the definition of creativity right that's what steve jobs was all about that you know i don't want just a bunch of engineers who are trained in doing their engineer stuff i want people who have other interests who've done other things who yes they have the required skills but that's how i'm going to get creative thinkers and that's how i'm going to have an innovative company you've told us a couple of good stories about or examples of, of people who kind of have combined different worlds. Is there, is there one that is your favorite or maybe one that's just like the craziest combination that comes to mind? Oh gosh. Um, I think I gave you a lot of the good ones that have been top of mind. Um, <laughs> I did have somebody recently reach out to me. She's not a client yet, but this was the craziest one I've heard. She's been working on a, a fishing boat um, she runs, she also runs a, um, a coffee shop and she also has a sheep farm and, and by the way, went to an Ivy league school and had a previous career in finance. <laughs> so she was like, I'm struggling to tell my story. <laughs> yeah. I was like, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna, let's talk. <laughs> yes. Uh, because like so, just just to give you a couple of mine, and, and a lot of our audience has heard this, but I started my career as a futures trader in Chicago, uh, finance, and then I ended up starting a business out of graduate school. Um, no idea what I was doing, uh, but we basically sold some proprietary software to companies that were like building satellites so our our little tiny like invention went up in space in the largest satellite constellation in orbit i had no background in that world at all i worked with two smart engineers but i was like trying to figure out how to make contact and sell um and so like went from trading to that to content marketing in the internet it's like what, <laughs> like, you know, what, what do you do? How can you possibly draw a string through that? Um, and so I just, I, I'm just always fascinated by the zigs and the zags that people take. It's so interesting. But I find that story exciting. I find all these zigzag stories exciting, right? It's like the unexpected is cool. And, and I, 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 
think it's also just from back to what you said in the beginning, I have that on my website. I think the most interesting, intelligent, creative people, if you scratch a tiny bit below the surface, you'll find they all have some version of that story. Yeah, definitely. So I, I have a couple more questions. One of the things we do like to talk about here is when you do something different, when you choose to make a change, what are kind of the, some of the steps that, that people take? And these are often different. So I'm just curious from like your standpoint and the changes you made, maybe, maybe going to work for yourself. Um, like what were, how, how did you make that decision and what were maybe some of the things you thought about uh, setting up so that you, you know, sort of ensured success in that transition? Yeah. Well, so it's interesting because you asked me the question of like, what should people do? And I started thinking, oh, there's like four or five things. And then you asked me, what did I do? And I'm going, did I do any of those things? <laughs> um, so it was, uh, so I'll tell you my story and then I'll give you my, you know, advice, which some of which I followed and others I didn't. But, um, you know, like so much change is actually the, was the expression necessity is the mother of invention. So much change is actually just driven by necessity and not necessarily by strategy and then only later you go well that was actually a smart strategic move <laughs> <laughs> so much like that I um I had thought about you know sort of either being a permanent freelancer because you know 12 years ago when I started my independent consulting company it was still a relatively new concept to be an independent consultant and have that actually be a job and not just or a career choice and not just something you did because you were between jobs and so when I left my company um, I I, I left with a business partner, which I definitely recommend that made it feel more legitimate. You have a thought partner, you have a cheerleader built in, you have an additional person to do business development. So I think we did that right. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I think the people who knew us, particularly like the older people in our lives were like, so basically you just quit your job. <laughs> Like, no, I'm making a very strategic career move. But that strategic career move was, in all honesty, very much motivated by lifestyle choice or almost not choice, but necessity. So two little kids, I'm constantly in a situation where I'm in a client service firm, constantly in a situation where it's like, oh, wait, I have to get on a plane tomorrow morning. This is a childcare nightmare. Or like, my kid is sick. I have to leave, but my team is waiting for me. It, it was just a really challenging challenging way to, for me, other people figure it out differently, but for me, it just didn't work. So that was one thing. And then, you know, you mentioned, how do you prepare for it? How do you make sure it's not, you know, that it's going to be financially viable? I mean, that part, I, I just closed my eyes and leaped off the cliff, frankly. And I think I got lucky. We, you know, had clients right away and, you know, steady stream of clients for the first two years. Um, then we had a dip, but at least we had like the, okay, we know how to do, you know, the confidence of, uh, mm. but I think that was a little bit of luck, a little bit of, you know, I didn't do it when I was 25. I did it when I was 35. So I did have, I kind of knew what I was doing and I had the confidence in that. I definitely had no idea whether I would be able to sell work because I had never done that. But I think, you know, going into it with a pretty good network and a pretty clear idea of, what you're good at and what you want to do um, is a good place to start. But, you know, and by the way, I think that kind of dumb luck jumping off the cliff, if you want to frame it as such, is also a strategy. Because I think a lot of us can like, you know, a lot of people hold themselves back from doing something because, you know, well, you know, it needs to be better thought through and I'm not ready yet. And I'm not, I don't have enough money in the bank yet or whatever. And there are just certain things where you need to just kind of, trust and, you know, blind faith and trust also that if you fail, which inevitably you will, if you do enough of these things, I've failed at plenty of things that you're going to be able to get yourself back up, dust yourself off and figure it out. Um, and I think that's just the sort of self-reflection, confidence building, and a little bit of trust in the universe that gets you there. Yeah. Uh, I want to highlight a couple of things from that story, which is phenomenal like one uh the necessity or at least the ne the necessity instigating you looking at lifestyle design basically right like yeah. this environment doesn't work for my holistic life how do i build an income stream 
that does fit that, uh, which is distinct from work, <laughs> right? Like, like yeah. that's not really work. That's that is work life. That's integration, and that's thinking about it really holis- holistically. So we talk about that a lot. The other one was um, you didn't necessarily do this as a strategy, but the idea of kind of the, the easiest way to get yourself to make a change is freelancing, in my opinion, because you, you if you have a job currently, you're getting paid for some skill. All you have to do to be self-employed is go find somebody else to pay you for that exact same thing. And you can dial that up or down based on how much you want to work on your, your other thing. Um, you know, so I, I think that that was really- And I want to say on that- oh. Go ahead. Sorry Go ahead. to interrupt you, but I just want to say on that point, that was actually a strategy, the piece of it that was freelancing. So when we first started our company, we were like, of course, if you're starting a company and not just freelancing, you want to develop a client base where you're selling directly to your clients versus freelancing. I mean, at least in my world and probably in a lot of worlds, there's a lot of like a firm that needs you to come on as a temporary resource. So another consulting firm or brand agency, or now there's a ton of these like staffing companies or consultant aggregators. That's a different channel. And that does not build my business and my brand. But boy, was it useful in those first few years, both the initial startup and then, you know, getting used to that boom and bust cycle that's inherent in a service business like that. And so I did use that strategically, like I'm going to take what is essentially a freelance job, which is even maybe a little too junior for what I do, because that's part of how we're funding this company. This is like part of our bootstrapping of this company. Yes, absolutely. That's a great point. Those things are completely distinct. I I think of freelancing as, you know, someone who doesn't need to build a growth business, but wants the freedom and flexibility, they can do that. And that could be their sole income stream. But it's also just a great transition mechanism uh, to help you along the way to building your side hustle into a, into a full-time gig or, or whatever. I mean, I've done that. Um, again, you can, you, but, but you are selling your time, uh, you know, to, to basically yep. make ends meet. You're not building the business, getting clients, getting, you know, recurring revenue type, type of a thing. So those are definitely different, but I, I, I think it's a fantastic transition strategy to use. I mean, it's a strategy as old as time, right? It's like the classic, I'm going to be an actor and I'm going to wait tables while I do that. It's just another version of that. Or one of my clients calls it her barista strategy. I mean, she's never actually pulled the trigger on the barista strategy, but she uses it to help her think about when she's the film producer. And she said, whenever I'm worried about taking on a project that's not that profitable or not likely to be profitable, but I really want it to be part of my portfolio, I think, okay, I have a portfolio strategy. I have this income stream over here, which is chugging along great. I'm going to take this thing on. And I always have my rip cord, which is I can always be a barista. (laughs) She never has used the rip cord, but it's her kind of mental safety place. Yep. It's like, uh, it's called fear setting. Basically, that's the worst you know, possible outcome. And if she's okay with that, you know, life, life's going to be all right. So, um, all right. So you are, you work with people one-on-one uh, with, with personal branding. Talk to me about like your perfect client, somebody that gets the most out of what you do. And then I'm also going to, after that, I'm going to give you the floor to kind of say anything to our audience that you want to say that maybe we missed um, or that you just want to, a point you want to hammer home. Sure. Um... So the people that generally seem to find me and enjoy working with me are, you know, you know that you're in a mode where you're going, what do I do next? Um, Maybe you kind of have an idea pretty well cooked up and haven't launched it yet. Maybe you're actually a completely blank slate and you go, okay, I know I've done all these different things and I know I want to do something kind of meaningful and impactful and sustainable financially. Um, but I need help thinking about what that is, but you're in this moment of transition and you need to, like you said, find the through line of all the different things. So it is typically people who have a zigzag path, who have a career that's had a bunch of twists and turns, um, and maybe they're on-ramping or off-ramping. Maybe they're just switching careers or starting a company, Um, but okay, how do I make sense of where I've been? with a sense of integrity and confidence that I can bring to that story? And how do I enter that 
question of what's next with all of that confidence and integrity. Um, and then ultimately like, help me write my brand story, right? Help me, <laughs> blocking and tackling, like help me write that thing that goes at the top of my LinkedIn page. And like that thing that I use to introduce myself at the next, you know, conference or Zoom event or whatever. Um, so yeah. Excellent. And I do, and, and to your point, I do one-on-one -on -one coaching and I also do group workshops. And the next one is um, registration opens August 1st and will take place in the fall. And those are groups of four who I work with weekly. Great. Um, anything else you would like to say to the audience, uh, motivational or just anything I might've been a bad host and glossed over? I just feel so strongly embrace your zigzag. This is a feature, not a bug. You know, we're all running around feeling guilty or somehow not good enough, right? Because we aren't your friend. <laughs> to have the silver bullet career, but this world that we're living, first of all, you are who you are. Um, and, you know, embrace all of that joyful chaos and tangled up stuff, because believe me, there are riches in there. And those skills and experiences that you have are transferable and are even preferable, as you just said, uh, for many employers. Excellent. Uh, last question is just where can people find more about you and what you do on the Internet? And we will make sure we have uh, links to all this stuff in our show notes page. Awesome. So my website is Susan Meyer Studio, and Meyer has a little bit of a funny spelling, so it's M-E-I-E-R, but you said you'll have the link in there. Yep. There is a page within my website, um, or actually multiple pages, but if you go to personal branding within the website, all of the materials relating to what we talked about today are there. There's a free download um, also for, you know, five things you can do tomorrow to start on this journey. Um, and uh, there's, of course, a little contact form where you can reach out to me with any questions. All right. Excellent. Thank you so much for being here, Susan. I really appreciate it. I uh, love the conversation. I love that there's more people out there championing the, the zigzag path. I'm not alone anymore. We <laughs> so are. We're a big crew. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, have a, have a great rest of your day. Have a great week. And we will uh, follow up and talk soon. You too. Thanks so much for having me on. All right. Take care.